This episode is in collaboration with the FEU English Language Circle and brought to you by the Institute of Arts and Sciences Student Council for the 2021 ISE Fair. Litong Litox is a podcast series spearheaded by the FEU Literature Society where we engage with conversations of culture, art, social movements, structures, literature, and more. We start off with this episode of the foundations of Paulo Freire's Pedagogy of the Oppressed by defining humanization and dehumanization. Further, what it means to be humanized, correlating it with the Filipino concept of tao and context, we pose that in order to combat dehumanization, humanity must be restored from a personal and institutional perspective. Though, we must also ask whether or not it is fair that the oppressed are left to fight their own battles alongside starting the battle of humanization for both themselves and their oppressors. Hello everyone, so this is um, the first episode of our podcast series from FEU Literature Society and this is Litong Litox about oppression. So our first topic for this episode will be um, about Pedagogy of the Oppressed by Paulo Freire. And um, our theme is Down the Rails of Freire Express. And our main point is to point uh, um, our main point is to tackle issues that are close to the heart of the youth. Um, so that um, is basically a contemporary discussion um, and how we can basically address, alleviate or solve oppression in our system. Um, from our own experiences. So today we have special guests um, that will help us discuss from a more um, professional point of view, I guess, because uh, because we are students, we admit that we are limited. Um, so we're going to help fill in the spots um, with today uh, Sir Marco um, De Silva, who is the advisor of FEU Literature Society and one of the esteemed faculty members of FEU as well. So hi, Sir Marco. Hello. Good afternoon. And then we also have another guest, um, the beautiful and amazing, ooh, <laughs> Mom MJ, Mom Mary Joy, you. Yes. Ooh, um, so today we're going to talk about, um, yeah, like we said, pedagogy of the oppressed. And um, so we're going to tackle this from two different point of views. I will help, of course, in giving some sort of um, youth perspective and student perspective but today will be about um, mainly Sir Marco and Mommy Yu's perspective we're gonna focus on that so um, we'll start the discussion of course with opening um, some definitions um, so the first being humanization and dehumanization Mommy Yu and Sir Marco do you have any um, certain perspectives on how to make it easier for us to understand such concepts? MJ. Mm, okay, so I have here in my notes and I will read it out. Freire argues this for, for humanization is that the root of the problem is the relationship of humanization and dehumanization. Uh, Freire says that we must not think that dehumanization is natural or else we risk despair. So the um, issue that Freire is telling us here is what do um how should we approach the world our worldview in terms of um if we see other people you know oppressing um should we think that that oppression is natural and um that do we think that it is something that is natural and should be accepted in our world diba? um Freire's answer is that, okay, we must think about two things. Number one, humanization. That humanization is, um, according to Freire, the people's vocation, both affirmed and negated by those fighting for justice and oppressors. Dehumanization, in contrast, is, and I quote, this is on page 44 of my copy, is a distortion of the vocation of becoming fully human. This distortion occurs within history, but is not a historical vocation. Indeed, to admit of dehumanization as a historical vocation would lead to either cynicism or total despair. So Freire argues that the fact that there is struggle, our struggle of, of, of fighting, 
is proof that the human humanization is not natural and we should not think that it is. So, and Marco? Uh, to follow MJ's uh, definition um, and to simplify it a bit, uh, I think that's what Pierre meant in his book, Pedagogy of, Pedagogy of the Press. You have uh, humanization and dehumanization as opposites, so much so that dehumanization is a common thread in um, history, and uh, in as much as it is a common um, phenomenon, it's not something that uh, should uh, be ignored or should, um, in the the words of our you today, uh, normalized, because uh, there are uh, a lot of uh, problems with it. In so much as it is, it relates to the relationship of human beings and society. Itself. So there, that's what dehumanization and humanization means, uh, which I think leads to the question of uh, how can we make education more uh, more humanistic, which very later on we'll discuss. But where are we? Uh, this what's the next question? So, ano la pa, to, specific, to clarify that, um, because uh, we mm -hmm. specifically define dehumanization and humanization as both processes. So, they were like, what constitutes the process? What makes some a, a people, a group of people dehumanized? What makes them humanized? To put it into simpler terms, because I think for us Filipinos, and I'll contextualize it to the Philippines, mm -hmm. it's easier if we use the Tagalog term tao. Right. Um, and we yeah. always talk about um, tao ako, di ba? Or tao lang naman ako. Or tao ka din, tao din siya. Right? And, and when we talk, when we say in English, kasi humanization and humanism being human, it doesn't quite translate to our experience of being a tao or being a human being in a contextual situation. So when we say, for example, the humanization, and we think about our context, you can say it in terms of um, tinrato ka ba niya bilang tao? Meaning, did they affirm you as a human being with your rights as a human being with respect due to you as a human being? Diba? So, Ferry doesn't really speak specify in his definition of dehumanization that this directly correlates to oppression. Pero hindi ba kapag um, hindi ka tinarato bilang tao, then yourself, your totality is treated as someone or as something, not someone. Hmm. Diba? So, oppression is the root cause of this. Parang for me, in reading Freire, I think that um, oppressions, the, the root of oppression isn't really, you know, us wanting to take advantage of other people or take advantage of resources and all of that. But the root cause of oppression is us treating other people as not people. Na parang, sige, okay lang, hindi kita pasisweldohan ng tama. Kasi I'm different than you, I'm better than you. Parang I'm more human than you are. Diba? Or ano ba? Ano pa yung mga ibang example na related to us? In the drug war, lagot, baka mabibiyas ako. Pero I mean, this is, this is relevant, diba? Na parang, um, papatayin <laughs> kita. Papatayin kita kasi hindi ka tao. Drug addict ka. Right? And I, we want to talk about, you know, human rights and all these things. And I think the root, the root of it all is, tinrato ka ba bilang tao? And given the respect that is due to you as a person, or tinrato ka as just a thing. Thing versus human being, right? Two different things. And to add more uh, on what MJ said regarding that distinction or dichotomy between humans and uh, humanization and dehumanization, we also have to bring in the, con the context that, uh, or the, the quote-unquote post-colonial context that uh, uh, Freire is trying to bring into the fore. Because Freire is talking about in a... Uh, from uh, a certain historical uh, event, well, of course, in the place where Freire came from, wherein uh, oppression was understood, at least for him, uh, in the context of colonization, where human beings are not uh, given uh, the 
the things that they are supposed to be enlightened, uh, entitled with. And it's not a question of whether they deserve it or not. It Frey argues that it should just be uh, a default being a human being. So uh, those might be uh, human rights, uh, so much so that the person should be able to um, be expressed, to be able to express themselves in uh, what they do in their work. That's often not available in colonial and even in post-colonial context. Uh, you have still a lot of uh, uh, former colonies, uh, and even in the, the time that they were colonies, where people had to do things that were not exactly uh, expressive of themselves. So that's the problem that comes with the humanization when Freire talks about it. So there, just to add more context to what MJ uh, said, and also uh, to uh, well to say that what she said was very interesting regarding Tao in the Filipino context, because that's often something we uh, miss when we try to define humanization and dehumanization in conversations like this. We forget to contextualize it in the things that are close to us such as that common denominator between us, at least, of Tao. And Tao, uh, the fact that it's uh, not that understood versus uh, how we understand human beings in general defined in, say, a, uh, a Western conception of you being a human being, uh, already tells so much about how there is some type of dehumanization when it comes to our systems. So there. I agree, I agree. Mm-hmm. So Freire actually um, says, no, so I can see it in my notes, no, how to solve this problem. And it is his thesis statement um, in, his, in this whole chapter, and I think the whole book as well, that you know, in order to solve the problem of dehumanization, it is humanity that must be restored. So I'll mm-hmm. read it, right? Um, in order, so this is on page 44, in order for the struggle to have meaning, the oppressed must not, in seeking to regain their humanity, which is a way to create it, become in turn oppressors of the oppressors, but rather restorers of the humanity of both. So I think this is very beautiful. Like you don't just um, seek liberation, liberation in the sense of a feudal type of liberation where mm-hmm. I am cert- I, you know, I am free from um, oppression in terms of I don't have an, a master and I'm, I'm myself. Right, I'm by myself and I can live freely. Pero Freire says, okay, wait, um, you're not actually a liberator if you do that. You're not actually restoring humanity when you do that. What you're actually just done is you turned from being an oppressed to an oppressor because, you mm. know, if you finally give liberation to, let's say, your um, workers, tapos the workers um, have their own workers, then isn't that the, still the same system? So um, the point of this all and Freire's point is we should restore the humanity of both, not just one, not just specific people, not just, you know, hindi lang tayo gagante, pero we need to regain everyone's humanity for this to all work. Which brings us also to one of our um, questions as students when we were reading through it. Because um, Fair tells us, um, directly quote from him, only power that springs from the weakness of the oppressed will be sufficiently strong enough to free both. So that is noted, of course. Um, of course, that's the process. And that's, that's what he recommends. And it is true. Um, and we say that the oppressed must liberate themselves and their oppressors in the process. Diba? Um, but our question being that, and, and this is one of the questions that um, led us to an internal spiral, um, which is basically that, um, is it fair to obligate the oppressed for the liberation of their oppressors and themselves? Because isn't it also inherently oppressive to still say na, ikaw na yung nasaktan, but the solution is in your hands. Like you have to solve the manner of the offense that was um, given to you. So um, we'd like to ask that i guess that question now is it fair is it really like diba, na para, is it okay or is it acceptable for you to still have that obligation even when you're already disadvantaged 
Um, I think Freire answers okay. this, but mm -hmm. not in the way that um, is direct. I'm trying to look through my notes. But basically, he's saying that... Um, Marco, gusto mo? Hanapin ko muna yung notes ko. <laughs> sure. So, uh, regarding that uh, question, if uh, uh, the oppressed is already being oppressed, why is it uh, important for Ferry that uh, the oppressed themselves should liberate the oppressors? I would say that uh, uh, Ferry is correct in saying that uh, that should be the case, that the oppressors should, uh, the oppressed should have uh, uh, or should embrace the responsibility in um, liberating themselves, not only themselves, but also the oppressors. And this goes back to what he said about the uh, systems and uh, um, how these systems um, uh, let its constituents internalize its tenets or what it, uh, uh, what the, sy the, the system uh, perceives as, perceives as, at, as its uh, uh, values. Because again, the problem is not necessarily these agents that are in the system, but rather the system itself. This is why uh, Ferry, after all, was so uh, caught up with education throughout his work. So he thought that education was not only the problem, but changing it was also the solution. So that brings us to the context of why uh, he thinks that uh, we should not uh, just topple over the ones oppressing, but rather change them. Because what placed them there in the first place was not their uh, agency, so to speak, but uh, more of uh, their uh, themselves rather being caught up in the system. Because they are in the system, they have internalized the things that uh, are in the system so that they can climb up the system or prosper from it. So to make it more contemporary. Say, for example, you're a person that uh, doesn't have the means to, well, study things like literature, study uh, the humanities. Uh, you have been brought up in a family that places more importance in uh, finding work and providing for the family and, most of all, providing for yourself. Uh, in that context, whatever you learn in the system that would solve that answer would be uh, uh, the thing that would be good for you. So there, in that context, you have some internalization of values, uh, values that not are not that are not necessarily uh, philosophical. It's just something that is taught by quote unquote the world, and that we're, and when we think of this world, it's wrapped up already in the system that Freire really talks about uh, in his work. Because if we go back to his work, he was not only uh, he was not only critical of uh, the archaic type of uh, uh, system that is practiced in uh, the classroom, the pedagogy that is uh, for him oppressive, but also the, the systems in the social sphere that makes those systems possible in the first place. And that goes to the context of capitalism and um, various uh, preference in uh, that was mostly influenced by Marxism. So, uh, well, not to put too, too many jargons here. Uh, again, it, we have a society that uh, privileges some values over the others. And uh, when that happens, of course, people that are caught up in the system and have to live in the system must embrace these values in order to have some output in the values that is beneficial for them. So there you go why, why uh, there is such a problem when it comes to dehumanization. Am I correct? I don't have Yes, sir. Hmm. Dehumanization. Um, and uh, sorry, yeah. not only dehumanization. There, there. Uh, the oppressed uh, having the responsibility of uh, liberating not only the oppressed, but also the oppressors. Because the oppressors are not necessarily criminals or not necessarily... Uh, are not necessarily in, they're not necessarily intentional when it comes to oppressing people. Sometimes they have internalized values that makes them think that what they are doing is the right thing to do. 
You can see it across the examples that Freire discusses, even in things like the banking system. Uh, the banking system uh, in the first place is done by the teacher. Right? It's made possible by the teacher, so much so that the, the teacher is the one providing and uh, pushing this information, this D T I T H I S to students. Uh, uh, not necessarily because he wants to push that information, but rather he thinks that that's the right thing to do for a teacher. So uh, that, there, that goes back to the context of why do these oppressors do what they do? It's not necessarily because they want to do it. It's more of they are compelled to do it because of the values that they have learned from a system that is fundamentally uh, great. But so in saying that, I think also, mm -hmm. There, we have to put some sort of responsibility towards the oppressors um, because in terms of privilege and in terms of experience, they would, you know, have the upper hand. Parang, I feel like um, if we say that um, some of them don't mean um, to do what they're doing, it just sort of, um, I don't know, it, it's, it feels a little unjust. Diba? Mm. Parang, pero I understand 100%, no, Marco, what you're saying. I mean, mm. um, you know, we do exist in a system and, you know, the system is inherently not fair. Um, but we can make certain strides towards a more fair system or not a more fair, a fair period system, right? Um, and I found um, what, what I was looking for. Um, and uh, there are two things that, that I would like to point out. The, the number one thing is the line where Freire uh, says this. So if we go back to your question, Desiree, on is it really fair for the oppressed um, to take up action when sila na nga yung oppressed, um, Freire says this, no? Um, who are better prepared than the oppressed to understand the terrible significance of an oppressive society, right? And that's on page 45. And on page 47, he, he says another thing. He says... Um, to surmount the situation of oppression, people must first critically recognize its causes so that through transforming action, they can create a new situation, one which makes possible the pursuit of a fuller humanity. But, but the struggle to become, uh, to be more fully human has already begun in the authentic struggle to transform the situation. So basically what he's saying is that if we um, are, are struggling to transform the situation or for example in a more concrete example is this podcast diba? you're already questioning you're already trying to question the system that is already a step towards um humanization okay mm -hmm. um so let's let's keep reading further although the situation of oppression is a dehumanized and dehumanizing totality affecting both the oppressors and those whom they oppress it is the latter meaning the oppressed, diba? from their stifled humanity, wage for both the struggle for a fuller humanity, the oppressor who is himself dehumanized because he dehumanizes others, is unable to lead the struggle. So the argument that Freire says um, to answer your question is that the oppressors are themselves already dehumanized. Like Marco says, diba? They, I would like, I would not want to say they don't know what they're doing, but because they are already dehumanizing others, their humanity is already compromised. Diba? Mm -hmm. If you are, for example, um, a business owner and you know that you're not paying your correctly, you know you're not giving them their 13th month pay, and you argue that it's because of your own um, situation, then isn't that still the same thing? Right, mm. you are claiming that you are oppressed, but you are oppressing someone else, and you yourself are already humanized in that particular process. So it is the um, I totally agree with Freire and with Marco that um, the the oppressed cannot be uh, sorry, the oppressor cannot be the one to lead the struggle because mm -hmm. they will lead a struggle, and the struggle will be not. A hundred percent just because they're only looking at their context, they cannot see it from the bottom. 
diba? And correct in the comment section, um, Toph says, it will be again oppressive. That is correct. 